Good morning. I have hey, to good morning, everybody from sunny Florida. I have to apologize to Lisa, our producer. I totally just cut her off when she was talking to us. Huh. <laughs> Lisa, okay. I didn't even do it. that. <laughs> good morning, Caroline. Good morning, Jesse. How are you this morning? Good morning, you, guys. Good. Well, nice. I am Lee Chapman and here for Reload Talk again on a Saturday morning where we talk about all things real estate and how to buy and sell your home, the strategies you need to know. And I am super excited to have Jesse Tate with us today. Jesse is a female home inspector. I've never met a female home inspector. Wow, neither have I. So, so I am really, really and excited to dig into this. What a perfect personality, I think, and, and gift set, I think, for that process. But she is with Pillar to Post Home Inspections. Um, she is a military brat, so she understands personally the challenges of relocation. She's also a United States Air Force veteran. Thank you so much for your service. Um, she is um, married and has two kids, her husband's two kids, and they're four cats. And she was recently nominated for the Women Entrepreneur of the Year by the Pittsburgh Northern Ooh. Regional Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> so you are not only a home inspector, you're an entrepreneur. So um, we are so excited to have you here to tell us everything you know about the home inspection process and how you got into it. So thank you, Jesse. Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me on today, Lisa. Hey, Jesse. Welcome. I am really excited, as I said. I, I have never, in my 15 years of working in and around real estate, have met a woman home inspector. So tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you become a home inspector? I mean, who knew? it's not like you start as a child and say, when I grow up, I want to be a home inspector, but it's, it's a very cool and very necessary job. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Right. Sure. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I, I come from the world of construction. I actually spent many years as a architectural and engineering consultant um, on commercial projects. Ah. I did like design and layout. I worked in fenestration for a while, but what really got me started was when I first moved to Pittsburgh right after college, um, I didn't have a job. And I, a friend of my parents said, hey, I need help laying a hardwood floor for a week if you want some cash. That ended up being a year that I worked as a carpenter. Not the best one. I will tell you that right now. But uh, I did learn you know, a lot about construction. Um, I learned about you know, uh, what goes into an old Victorian home, which we have wow. so many here in Pittsburgh. And so it really sparked my love for construction altogether. And so... Fast forward many years, I decided that um, I wanted to be in business for myself. Um, as much as you know, I loved my career in construction, I just wanted more control over my life. And so, good for you. <laughs> thanks. So good I had a that's a, that, that's a huge for those of us that are entrepreneurs. It's it's a huge leap of faith. It is, yeah, and it's it's a very that first step is a, is a big one. I would recommend a guardrail. So, um, absolutely, yeah. or bumper pads. Right, right, yep. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I I did, I was on a five year plan to work for myself, and I was about two years into that plan, um, just trying to find you know test driving different things on what business I wanted to go in, and I had a, a an investment property, and I was putting it on the market. And the, I knew the market was really hot at the time. And the, the young lady that was buying my house, it took her um, over two and a half weeks during her 10-day contingency in order to secure a home inspection. And I was like, why? And they said, well, all the good home inspectors are booked out three weeks. And a light bulb went off. And I was like, I can do that. Ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding. Yeah, so I started researching a little further. And I sold my house. I used the... Um, I made a very good return on investment. I made about 50% profit on that. Wow. And yeah, I did. You know, it was my house. And then I did all the work myself to fix it up. And then I rented it out for two years. And then by the time I sold it, I sold it for 50% more than what I paid for it. So That's fantastic. Um, yeah, thanks. So, so, so uh, what sort of training did you have to, to undertake to become a home inspector? Home inspector. So um, not as much as you might think. Um, <laughs> That's scary. It is scary. And that's one of the things that I talk about and that I advocate for is that honestly, if you go to a two week course, basically you're good. And let me tell you, like, um, that's one of the things that I didn't realize when I, you know, I thought, oh, this is great. They assured me to be ready to inspect. And um, I, just I, I don't I don't think consumers in general know that 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 is true. 
Right. And, and I tell people, you know, I teach classes for Allegheny County um, for first time home buyers. And I let them know that, you know, hey, look, you need to find a good home inspector. If it's not me, at least make sure that it's somebody that's qualified. So I'm on the board of directors for ASHI Western Pennsylvania. I'm also on the ASHI National. ASHI is the American Society of Home Inspectors. Okay, got it. Yep. And so I am on their uh, national leadership board as well. Um, probably Thank you. Of my age. and Thank and you. We love, Lindy and I love truth tellers. <laughs> um, our, our community is focused on really preparing consumers with what they need to know. And we certainly didn't know this. Right. And, and, and a lot of people don't. And so I like to, to have a, an informed, um, you know, buyer, right? The more information you have, the better it is. And so um, in Pennsylvania, you actually don't have to have a license. We're an unlicensed state. Some states you do, New York, Texas, uh, Arizona. There's a few others that you actually have to have a license. But to be a home inspector in Pennsylvania, you have to have gone to a two-week class and you have to have insurance. <laughs> right. And, and that's really one of the reasons why we're doing this is because I think the more the home buyer and the home seller knows, the more equipped they're going to be because every state is different, and especially right. if you move around and you might have been in one state where, you know, these things were more regulated and then you move to another state and it works, it operates differently. Um, right. Let's just kind of get right into what do consumers need to know about, um, about how to find that reliable home inspector? Sure. So the first thing, um, now I'm a little biased because I'm an ASHI inspector. Um, when looking at some of the different organizations out there, I decided to join ASHI because it had a higher uh, standard, right? So you have to do more in order to be an ASHI certified inspector. So um, you have do more, to do more like what? So you have to go through a background check to make sure that you're not a criminal, which is not required in our state. Um, you have, so you have to keep a million dollars in coverage. Uh, you have to carry, you know, insurance as well up to, you know, for a million dollars, you have to have done so many mentor inspections, working with a seasoned inspector. And then to get the full certification, you have to do 250 inspections as well as, uh, pass a national exam. So that's why I decided to go the route of an ASHI inspector, as opposed to just, Hey, let me do this because I want people to see that I have been through training and that I have, right. um, you know, I have, I'm qualified to do this for you. I'm not. So can a consumer go directly to the ASHI website they can. to find, a, find an ins a home inspector in their area? They can, they can go to ASHI.org and that's A-S-H-I.org and they can look at the list. They can, um, I believe search by zip code. Uh, you can search by state, maybe by county, but you, you'll be able to find an ASHI inspector through there. And there are different levels. There's a, there's ASHI, there's ASHI Associate, which is somebody that's going through um, and to get their certification. So just because they okay. don't have their exact certification doesn't mean that they're not qualified. It just means that they're going through their process, right? Got and it. they probably haven't been doing it for a couple of years. So, okay. um, so that's one thing. Another thing, you, wanna, you do want to check Google reviews. I try to stay away from Yelp. And the reason why is because I have had so many people submit a beautiful review for me on Yelp and they deem it as um, un unfounded. And that is, hmm. yeah, and they- It's, like you're, it's like you're paying all your friends. Yep. And okay. I've had people that I that didn't even hire me um, that you know maybe I did an inspection on the home that they're selling and they weren't happy and left a negative review, which happens. You have to have thick skin to be in this business. And Yelp will take that and you know they secure that as you know their gold standard. Got it. So I, I always say, look at Google, Ask, you know, ask around, go onto forums, go onto the next door app. You know, somebody has an inspector that they love. Is your um, realtor a good source? I think the realtor is a good source to start with for sure, because they have people um, that they use. Sometimes they like, um, but I have a lot of people that find me through other means. You know, I have, it's funny. They say like, you should have 30 to 40 realtors that, uh, that recommend you frequently. I probably only have 10. But I, I have a big network through architects. So mostly like many of the architects in the area use me because I have that background. Not that I was an architect, but I have I have the architectural right. background. Right. And so, you know, it's it's a big word of mouth thing. And so, you know, I, I just you know, the more information you have, the better. Yeah. 
Um, I want to stop just a second and just welcome people that have tuned in. Wendy Gilch is here and Victoria is here and she um, she actually made a comment. She said kudos for getting under the um, homes and attics and, um, and all the yucky spaces that an inspector has to go. Thanks, Victoria, for your comment. That's so true. It's not the most glamorous job. Not at um, all. It is. We have Mr. Kim here from Seoul and Bruce Waller is here. And, um, hey, so thank Bruce. You. Or, um, thanks, people, for tuning in. We appreciate you. If you have questions for Jesse, be sure to to ask them in the comments. Um, I um, wanted to just kind of ask you because I, I think as a real estate agent, it's always interesting to me. Sometimes I'll get you know seventy five report page reports, and sometimes they're inadequate. Um, how do you? What should you expect? What What do you need to look for and and expect when you get that home inspection? Sure. So I always recommend that that my my buyers attend because if you just if you're like, well, I don't have time in my schedule, and you just get that report, it is scary. And people, fine. especially first time home buyers, I'm like, you know, help yourself. Like, just attend the inspection because if I can explain to you what is right. happening, it's going to be such a less scary experience. Right. And not everything is created equal. That's that's correct. And right. and you have to realize that I am only being paid to show you what is wrong with your house. Right. I am not going to show, you know, the, the beautiful architecture. I'm not right. going to show the amazing platements. I'm going to show you that peeling paint, that little bit of rot, right. you know, all of these really bad things. Right. So, so you're the skunk at the garden party. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I'm everybody's worst mm -hmm. enemy. <laughs> okay. But, so tell us, tell us, about, yeah. tell us about overall. So I'm assuming that all home inspectors are generalists. So because are. they're able, okay, so generalists. Yeah. So, so, so tell us about sort of what you look for, how you do it, how long it takes. Absolutely. So I always explain that your home inspector is like your general practitioner. We have a good working knowledge of every system in the home, but we are not a specialist in any single one of them, nor should we, even if we do have a certification. So if you go to your um, PCP with in your knee hurts, they're not going to perform surgery. They're going to send you to somebody to do that. So that's what I do. So I write basically a prescription for further evaluation. So if I see that there's moisture intrusion coming into the house and that there's a little bit of a structural issue, I'm gonna send you to a basement waterproofer or to a structural contractor or sometimes a structural engineer, depending on the severity of um, what I'm seeing in the home. Now, and do you so get kickbacks for doing that? I mean, is it like a closed group? No, 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 no. <laughs> and I, I do make recommendations to certain contractors. I will tell you that I have it is a huge conflict of interest if you get a kickback on anything. Right, agreed. I have people on my list because I've either used them in my personal home or I've inspect, inspected their work myself, and I appreciate the quality of work that they do. If and I've had some people that I've I've you know recommended that suddenly something you know something goes wrong, they get off my list because I right. want to put my name to it. And but no, right. I don't get any type of money or kickback from it. Um, okay, good, it's, good to it's know. Not mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, so cover the general areas. What, what can we expect and how long does it take? Like, where do you start? You know, sure. you have a checklist you carry with you. I do. So tell so us about I it. To the ASHI standards of practice and you can go online again, go to ASHI.org. Uh, the website was up earlier. You can go there and pull out the standards of practice. And so we go over the main systems of the house. So I have a routine that I go through I work with my iPad. It has everything highlighted that I have to click off, that I have to let people know. And so I start, I go around the exterior of the house twice and I mark anything, you know, I'm looking at your structure, I'm looking at the wall, uh, I'm looking at the way that the electricity comes into the home, you know, noting like any deficiencies that I'm seeing. And I'm taking hundreds of photos while I'm on site, right? Okay. They don't all go to the report, but I'm taking hundreds okay. of photos. So then when I go, then I go up to the roof, whether I get on it directly, being that I'm five foot tall, I work by myself. Um, if I can reach it with my 16 foot ladder, I do, but I'm not going to pay. Uh, I'm not going to buy a big truck and pay a gentleman to carry a 28 foot ladder for me. So if I can't reach it on with my 16 foot ladder, I actually have a 360 virtual reality camera that I put up onto a 35 foot pole. And I look at the roof that way. It's actually pretty amazing. And if you go to my uh, Facebook page, you'll see some of my 360 photos and you can okay. like, turn around in them. So then I go down to the basement 
And once I go in the home, I go into the basement because that's the second area that has the largest amount of deficiencies in it. So again, I'm looking at the structure from the interior. I'm looking at any moisture intrusion. I'm going through your mechanical. So you're, I'm looking at your water heater, your furnace, your electrical panel, um, the, the structure of the flooring. I'm trying to see if there are any pests that are coming in, uh, any mold, any, anything wrong with the structure. Then I, I actually go up to the attic after that. And I'm looking at the under, if I can get access to it, and I'm looking at the underside of the roof. I look at your inspection or your insulation. Uh, I'm looking for any improper electrical connections. Make sure that all of your um, plumbing and um, exhaust fans are properly vented to the exterior. Uh, I look to see if I can find any rodents. Spoiler alert, 90% of them have it. Um, you, you know you, what? That is some sellers, some buyers and sellers, that is their biggest fear that they have an infestation. It, it's we're, we're living in their territory. We live in their world. They're getting in through the eaves, through the soffit, any means possible through your vents. When your dryer vents broken, little mice can run right in. Right. Okay. So, it. Yeah. It's 90% of the houses that I inspect. The other 10% are too new for them to come in yet. So, and you make a determination at that point what needs to be remediated, meaning if it's a true infestation or if, you know, you just have the average field mouse. Right. Yeah. And most of the time it's the average field mouse. Uh, mouse. Occasionally I'm making eye contact with a colony and therefore my recommendation is, you know, to have that, you know, have, have a pest control person. Exterminator. Come out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And typically, you know, and, and just to put a little, um, bit on here, like, you know, bait and, you know, use poison and, and, uh, use the snap traps. Don't do the sticky traps. It's cruel. So, yeah. um, and then we go through the rest of the home as well, testing the electrical, looking at the finishes, testing your plumbing throughout. So that, that's the basic of, you know, what we do during a home inspection. And you can ex inspect, you can expect the inspection to last anywhere from an hour and a half to four hours, depending on the size of the home and what all we're finding while on site. Well, and that report is so, and you you live in an old area and I've owned a Victorian home. And so I know how these reports can be. And for that first time home buyer, um, or even if you've done it 10 times, it can be terrifying because you get this right. long list of everything that is wrong. And I think one of the biggest challenges and one of the hard parts as a buyer and as a buyer's agent um, is trying to figure out what needs to be addressed and what doesn't. Do you right. need lines that you use. I mean, if you over ask, you risk ruining the sale and ruining the goodwill of the seller. Right. If you under ask, then you've not protected that buyer's investment. Um, and it's real hard to get that balance. Do you have any guidelines that you would recommend? I always ask my inspector, you know, if this was your home you were buying, what are the red flags? Right. Um, so that's actually not legal for us to answer. Um, so I mean, ah. yeah. Oh, so we can't ask you what are the deal breakers? Right. Oh, I ask anyway. Yeah, you can ask and I can tell you what is the more severe um, action, but I am not allowed to advise financially whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I get asked this every single day of my job. What should I, you know, should I ask for money back on this? And I said, look, I'm legally not allowed to advise you because I have no vested interest in this. Right. I'm an impartial party, but I can tell you what the larger items are that should but be. But you're expected. providing an expert service you're providing an opinion that people are paying for so so i tell you what the analysis and so that's more what i'm seeking or, or what are the red flags not what should be fixed but you know what are the items because especially and it's a lot of times i you know because the buyer gets so wigged out over the long list of things they're really five dollar fixes a lot of them oh yeah sure so and what i do is I create, on that axle and you can kill a deal if you ask for too much right so i create a summary list right so at the beginning are my top things that are the the biggest safety issues and the biggest money issues so if you have a water heater that is backdrafting into the home and causing carbon monoxide it's going to be a cheap fix, but that's going to be at the top of my list because it's a big safety thing. Right. If you have some structural issues, that's going to be at the top of my list. Select right. paint on a, on a window and trim is not going to make my summary list. Items. Right. That so makes you're, sense. Your big money things there. So those are the things that they typically take back and negotiate on or the things that go on my summary list that I believe are the bigger money and safety issues. And so that's, that's how I can advise, but I can't say you should ask for this. You should ask for that. Right. I always defer to the real estate agent because 
even though I do know my market, it's not up to me to determine what they should ask for because I don't know in our area, we're so hot right now that they might have gone up against six other bidders and they might be hanging on by a string. So I'm right. not going to say you should ask for this. Yeah. I'm going to refer back to the real estate agent to say what you should ask for, what you shouldn't. But I am going to let them know what should be addressed in the home. Can and we again, that, sorry, Lindy, go ahead. Buyer needs to be educated because like you said, every market's different. If you've already gotten a really good price, you, you don't right. want to. You've got to take that into consideration. Or if there are multiple offers, um, or if there were other offers and you got it, you, you've got to take it's a it's a really fine balancing act that right. even I, an agent, can't answer for you because at the end of the day, it's your investment. It is. And I'm not like you, I can't really advise or tell anybody. Um, but that's again why it's so important for the home buyer to take the guesswork out. I do think it's interesting. There are a couple of new technologies coming up. Um, I don't know if you've heard of, of Zaya, I believe is how it's said, or Punch List. And there's some other um, technology-led um, reporting methods that are on the horizon. Are you familiar with any of these and ways that um, it might be being made a little bit more uniform to take the guesswork out? Um, that's actually not something that I have personally uh, explored and worked with at this point. Um, okay. You know, I have, I, I essentially, uh, in my in my software that I use, I do have a punch list that I go through and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I mean, that's something that I'm used to working with, but no, I have not worked with that at this point, but I'm, you know, I'm always interested about learning new, new things. Well, before we move on from this, I'd love to ask a question about sellers. Do sure. sellers ever hire you prior to listing their house to Absolutely. provide an inspection so that they are not caught, you know, flat footed, um, and that they have an opportunity to, you know, remediate any of the issues that may be of concern before they even list the property. The second part of that question is, and Lindy, maybe you can answer this. Do they have an obligation to divulge anything critical that they did address? Yes. So to answer the first part, I do pre-listing home inspections very frequently. I actually have a couple coming up this week and it's for that exact fact. Like they don't want to be blindsided by problems right. in their home. They've been living there many years. Right. Oftentimes I highly recommend it when you're selling a house for a loved one, say an elderly parent, um, mm -hmm. you know, in a state, because at the very least you can know what's wrong. You can price it appropriately and you can sell it faster and take some of that negotiation out of the back end. And, and also get a non-emotional, non-biased assessment right. of your property. Right. right. Absolutely. So then once you get that, you can choose whether you're going to um, correct any of it or whether you're just going to disclose it. And yeah. I'll let Lindy handle the second portion of that. Well, I don't like surprises. And so that's a lot of times I would I would encourage a seller to do that so that um, when they weren't surprised and, and found out they needed a new roof or that their electrical panel was um, hazardous. Um, and then it also took away the buyer's agent's power because if we've kind of addressed all of those things, we've disclosed anything that needs to be disclosed, but we've, we've addressed all those little red flags and even the non red flags, but then they don't appear on the uh, inspection report right. when the buyer goes and does one. It, it, it just kind of diffuses the situation because they get a report and they're like, wow, it's a, it's a <laughs> one of the cats. Hello. Um, and it, um, and it, it takes away that negotiating power because things are done. Uh, here, I'll give you a great example. When I sold my home, I did a pre-listing inspection prior. It was just a visual one. It wasn't one that I had to provide a report because I didn't have a report. But right. they were just you know, make sure that everything was up to code on the electrical system. I had all new systems, so that wasn't a concern. Um, any kind of little tiny minor you know, links at the faucet or um, the drywall screws that weren't the correct screws in the pull-down attic. Nothing wrong with it. It shows up in every inspection, but not in mine. And, uh, but it was interesting because the sell, the buyer's agent, they came in and they did the inspection. The, the agent didn't even come to the, in fact, she never came to the house, which is another interesting story because the buyer found the house. Um, but then she sent me a request for $4,000 in lieu of repairs. Mm -hmm. Well, I had the inspection. So I knew did there were the repairs. Did what? she, did she detail the repairs? No. You mentioned them. Um, she kind of, you know, like they need a new carpet on the stairs. Well, I knew that. And the seller and the buyer and I had already spoken about that. And this buyer had dogs and she wasn't worried about the carpet. Yeah, but that's um, a visual and cosmetic issue. That's not a structural right. or yeah, well, right. issue. You before you bought the home. But anyway, but she sent me this long, it wasn't a long list. It was a name several things, but then just said $4,000 
in lieu of repairs. And so I asked for the inspection report and she sent it to me. Um, and there weren't $4,000 of repairs, but I knew that. And so I was able to then negotiate it. And I actually didn't pay for any repairs. Um, I just turned it back to the buyer's agent and I said, um, you know, if you want to rebate this from the commission, because I'm paying you $20,000, um, then you can do that. But again, that's that knowledge is power. Right? Absolutely. I and you know, it. at the end of the day, you either want the house or you don't. I mean, if yeah. you're going to nickel and dime like that, just right. well, then buy a new house. Right. I mean, if, if, if you're worried about, you know, issues with the structure of the property, buy a new house. Yeah, well, and right. but I'm, when I'm on the buyer's side, I'm fighting for the buyer too. So, and I, and I, I wouldn't do something that was like, ask for something that wasn't there, but my job is to get the best value for my client. Um, but it's, it's, it's knowing what to ask for and that that's challenging. So, so talk, talk to us a little bit about the biggest mistakes that you see consumers make. I mean, once you've provided them with this detailed report, what, right. what are some of the things that strike you like, Oh man, that's not going to end well. So first is uh, read the report. I, I have so many people that I do an inspection report for. They pay me good money to do this. They don't read the report. And then uh, two weeks later, you know, or after they close, I get a phone call. Hey, this is wrong. I should have known about this. Yep. It's uh, section 7.1.9. It's, it's right there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Stupidity. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of which, how much is an inspection are the rates all across the board based on your you know length of time as an inspector are there standard rates yeah so there's there's really not a standard rate we all kind of determine our own pricing we all try to be price competitive i will say that i am not the cheapest inspector out there nor do i ever want to be right um, and, and a lot of times if, if you're going to go with somebody else and somebody's negotiating to you know somebody will do it for a hundred dollars cheaper go for them Right. Because that's, that's the person I'm going to probably have the biggest problem with on the back end. Right. Uh, so, you know, they, they, I know mine personally range anywhere from 350 up to the other day. I did one that was 1500. Um, I've done some that were in the few thousands. Um, and, and what, why is that? Because it's a larger footprint home or it's larger footprint home, the, the more uh, mechanicals you have. So if you have something that's two furnaces, two air conditioners, you have a mother-in-law suite, that's going to cost a lot more money than that two bedroom condo that I just did. And so does someone it, know that before they contract with you? Absolutely. Okay. They yeah, do. I, I, they do. I, um, we, pill, uh, through pillar to post, so I own a franchise. Pillar to Post has, um, it. you get an email when you book and they tell you how much it's going to be. And then you have an email with the inspection. From there, you can add any services, any additional services that you want onto there. Got and of it. course, service comes with additional charges. So sure. if you just want, you know, a, a basic uh, inspection, it's one cost. If you want my high-end inspection, you want water testing, you want mold testing. Uh, I actually do DNA testing, meth lab testing. Uh, I had, uh, I have a lot of services that I do radon past, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that costs a lot of money. Some people want to know everything about that home and yeah, they're going to run into several thousands of dollars, but okay. it's because I have t high lab costs on that too. But for the mm -hmm. average home, 2000 square foot house with pest and radon, which is, um, typical in Pittsburgh, um, you're looking at probably 700. Yeah, that's about that's about what it is here. Um, a little bit more if they have a pool. I don't imagine you have many pools in Pittsburgh, or do you? Uh, we're starting to. So I yeah. don't do pools uh, because of the liability. So what I do is yeah. I recommend that a pool company come out and do that because they, they will do. I will look over your equipment and give you mm -hmm. as a supplementary. I will look over the equipment, but I can't guarantee that there are no leaks or that it's working properly. Right. Yeah. Plus, and it's really an operation for a few months out of the year. So if you want me to look at your pool September through June, I can't tell if it's working right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's a good and that's a good rule of thumb is to to get even if you get the pool company that's been servicing it, because a lot of times my sellers or my buyers will just pick up the pool company that's been selling it, which is which is which can be a very good practice because they want to stand behind the work that they've been doing. And so I've, I've usually found that pretty effective. And if the previous homeowner was happy with them, you know, why mess it up? Right. Um, but 
also be very helpful because I had something like that happen recently where we had something inspected and, and fixed prior and then they continued with that service afterwards. But when something went wrong, then they were able to go, look, you're the one that inspected it and checked it and fixed it before we bought the home. And we were able to get them to stand behind their work afterwards. So that can be a good thing as well. Um, All right, now let's talk about the elephant in the room, Lindy and Jesse. <laughs> oh, don't bring up the C word. How, the C word. Tell us a little bit about how you've dealt with, since you are crawling all over people's homes and properties, how have you dealt with the COVID pandemic? How has that affected your business? Uh, well, it affected it like horrendously. Um, I will tell you, I March 17th, I got the notice that, you know, the next day I was to cease all operation. And so I had to sit in my house and twiddle my thumbs and you know, received for the longest time, no help from the government. And because I didn't have, because I don't have employees, um, I didn't qualify for many of the programs out there. So um, we were able to start inspecting again on March or May the 15th. And so I was able to open okay. the, the market has now flooded and I am busier than I have ever been in my life. So mm -hmm. I'm very okay, excited. why is that? Just because people are back out looking at homes again, making purchases or selling, and, and they need the home inspections? For those I mean, basic months, question, but I'm just asking. So we have a large um, medical population here in Pittsburgh. Uh, one of our big uh, industry is medical. And so okay. we had doctors and nurses that were moving to the area that could not secure housing. They couldn't stay in a hotel. They couldn't get an Airbnb. You know, they couldn't. Whoa. So we had people that were moving into the area that could not move. We had people that were approved to, you know, for the loan and ready to, you know, jump on it that had to hold off for two months. So all of that business that would have happened over those two months was gone. And so you had people sitting there and looking, looking, looking online and getting right. ready. The moment the yeah. market opened, you know, they were jumping. Kind of, and, kind of like the unemployment call centers, yeah. you know, you can't yeah. get through. I mean, you can't. Okay, well, that's that's there's not a lot of inventory, and so they're scooping up the inventory that's there because there's it's a supply and demand issue as well. Yep. Um, there are a couple people on here from Boston. Barbara Tibbetts is on here. She put her um, her home up there. She's selling it. Um, so for Barbara as a home seller, what are some tips that you would say for a home seller um, when she gets? She even laughed and she said, um, "Choose another house if somebody's nitpicking you for repairs." Do you have any great tips for a for a home seller that's already got their home on the market, um, but ways to kind of stand their ground and focus on the things they need to focus on? Right? I mean, there's some things that are safety issues, whether it's fire safety, health, water hazards that they need to focus on. Um, right. I would say that when they, you know, when as a seller, when you get that uh, report back that, you know, these are the things that the buyer wants you to do, you know, that you still have negotiating power at that point. And again, you know, a lot of it is market dependent, whether you have a hot market like we do or whether you have a stagnant market where mm -hmm. it's you know, buyer's market, you know, all that kind of depends. Uh, but I know that, you know, when I sold my house um, a couple of years ago, I had a buyer that, you know, nitpicked everything and wanted everything done. And I said, you know what, I'm doing a few things. Some of the bigger things I needed a new water, you know, a new water heater, which I knew. And I already had on order because it went literally the day I put it on the market. And so, you know, that was fine. I had no problems doing the safety issues and some of the other things, but I wasn't going to spend, you know, I was selling the house because I didn't want to care for it anymore. So, um, you know, I, I do say, you know, stand your ground on some of that because like a lot of the things that people ask for are really super easy things that I believe belong on a honey do list rather than a seller's to do list, you know? Right. And there's a huge difference between, you know, visual and cosmetic updates or changes right. and structural and safety issues. Right. 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 I think, I think right. some people, especially sellers, look mm -hmm. at this, you know, may look at this list emotionally, like you're attacking them. Folks, right. wake up. This is a business transaction. There's no it room is. for emotion. Nope. I, and, and, you know, and I've had, I had a seller that had probably one of the most beautiful, well-maintained homes I've ever, I've ever seen. And there were, but there were a few list items on there and, they were so offended that the wife called me crying that I was attacking her yeah. home. And I said, please, Seriously. That's she doesn't person. have enough to do. No, again, that's where we go back to, you've got to take the emotion out because it is emotional right. and it's very right. personal at times. Um, Tori McCuller who's watching and she made a great comment earlier because she's been in relocation. And so she's watched 
inspections gone bad numerous times. But she said, is there any sort of COVID air test for homes, which I think leads into something interesting that you're getting ready to be doing, but is there any way you know if there's exposure in, in a home for COVID? So uh, there, there's so many things that are up in the air at this point. And I would say no for the air test because it is a virus. It is a bacteria. It does not live in the air. It is not airborne. Uh, mm -hmm. It can be airborne during transmission through droplets, et cetera, et cetera. But um, what it does is it sits on surfaces. And so can it be tested? I'm sure there's a way. I do not do that. Oh, I'm sure someone will find a way. The, and my lab just sent me information saying that they can test. Um, the best thing to do is just what I've always suggested is have your place deep cleaned. I mean, well, you have to do that anyway to sell it. Anybody who do doesn't anyway. spend the time and the money to deep clean their property is not ready to list. Right. I mean, we know that it's not, you know, I do meth lab testing because that's kind of a big deal. I do asbestos testing. You know, there are so many testings that I do because it's very expensive for cleanup, but for, to, to clean COVID, you just, you just clean it. So yeah. you can go through and sanitize, make sure that the product is, is you know, COVID approved and, um, you know, have it deep cleaned. What I've done when I move into a house is actually hire a company to come through and do a deep clean sanit sanitizing of it. And the which best does, money you'll ever spend. It absolutely. And, and on a personal note, the one thing that I like to do when I move into a new house, I replace my toilet seats as well. Because even when you do a deep clean, somebody's been using those and stuff gets into the little, uh, I put new toilet seats on. So that's Well, my and don't forget all the light switches, doorknobs. Yep. I recently moved into a new property in Florida. And the first thing I did was get my Lysol, you know, my antibacterial lemon scented fantastic and Lysol wipes and did every doorknob inside and out and every light switch. I mean, it does right. make a difference. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you know that it's nice and clean and bright and fresh at that point and you feel comfortable. You're not putting your stuff on their stuff. You're not getting right. some germs and dog hair and et cetera, et cetera. I like the idea of replacing the toilet seats. That's a, I don't know that I've ever thought to do that. <laughs> hey, we've got a great comment from, from one of our listeners today that says that there are currently fogging machines that can clean homes for COVID. Yeah. So there there are, and I, I will have to tell you that I am actually kind of- I was going to say, this is the perfect segue. Robert, thank you, because you're just going to, you just, you just gave her a softball for her. <laughs> so during the time when I was shut down, I'm an entrepreneur, like I said, I am used to working 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Sitting home idly did not work for me. So the first thing I did- It doesn't work for most entrepreneurs. It does not, I, and, and God bless my husband because he was dealing with me clawing at the walls. So I had, um, I, I owned already some ozone generators because I sometimes help prep people's homes for sale. Um, we won't go into all that, but I owned these ozone generators already. So I did some quick research and found out that there are actually white papers that um, the ozone generators are, you know, uh, they can sanitize um, the original, um, the SARS virus, which is where the COVID comes from, mm -hmm. as well as bacteria, mold, et cetera, et cetera. And it does it without um, a chemical uh, usage. It, it's just like a it's, a, it's a reaction. It turns oxygen into- Is that what uh, they use to sanitize planes? Uh, they do. They use that in hotel rooms. They also use it to kill bed right. bugs. Uh, there's a lot of things that ozone- Ugh used for and so i started volunteering to clean up my time to use my time uh volunteering cleaning uh police cars and uh sanitizing their cars and so mm -hmm. we did actually have a few first responders that had some covid uh patients and they were um you know very scared so i would travel around with my little ozone generators and i actually ended up starting a business um and i now have like five municipal contracts locally of um first responders. good for you the, and I'm still doing that. I'm actually about ready next week to launch the next phase of it, which is a bit different. It does use essentially a fogging machine. It actually uses an electrostatic sprayer. Uh, it's a vapor that goes on and it, um, I'll, I'll be ready to launch that next week. So I don't want to go too much into that, but um, there are some things that can be done and there's something that I'm coming out with that'll actually prevent it. And it'll be the first thing um, that's being released. To I, I, I think that you could quit your day job right there because there will be so many consumers 
yeah. that when they ultimately do find a cure or until they find a cure, they're going to want to put these systems, you know, all over the house, right? Um, yeah. In their cars. A yeah. Great idea. Good for you. So I see you being nominated for 2020 for Entrepreneur of the Year as well. Uh, that's a possibility. I uh, I actually am in the process of signing an exclusive distributorship for my region of the country for this um, product that is not on the market, but it is actually EPA. Um, certified to kill viruses for 90 days after oh, outlet. Fabulous. And and what like that? Is it based on the square footage or length yeah, of time? Square footage. Square mm-hmm. footage. It, is it, yeah. I know my husband's company, they're not even going back to work because the, the building is requiring them to do extra deep cleaning and it's an expensive $10,000 a, a week. Yeah, That's and crazy. I will be able to treat a company four times a year. Yeah, and, that's amazing. That's amazing. It, I imagine yeah, the cost it, savings on that would be. The cost is not cheap, but it's four times sure. a year. So, you know, I. Like, yeah, but what's your life worth, right? So. Exactly. Yeah, schools yeah. will be able to, to reconvene. Um, it, it's well, going to be. This is to be able to operate. It's that or not be able to operate. And I, and I love Barbara Tibbetts. Uh, the, her comment that rentals yep. should use this before yes. they turn it over, you know, in between clients before they turn it over. That's an yeah. excellent idea. And that's, you know, that that's definitely something that I would recommend is, you know, invest in an ozone generator, you know, look at g- getting a good one. Don't buy the $50 one, you know, spend a few hundred, mm-hmm. get a good one. And you run it for a few hours, turn it off, it, well, put it on a timer because you can't enter once it's um, once it's in there. You have to put it on a timer because it is dangerous to breathe the the ozone. But oh, it goes okay. back to being inert and it returns back to oxygen um, in a very quick phase. And then you can go in. It smells fresh and clean. You know wow. any virus, bacteria, molds have been killed in that space. There are a lot of clean freaks out there that would do it with or without COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Me. Yeah. Me, me too. Me yeah. too. Clean That's free. why I had it to begin with. Um, you yeah, can excellent. actually get a small one. You go to a hotel, run it for like an hour, or you can actually, <laughs> most hotels do have them and you can request that one is ran. There's more than likely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, whatever you do, don't bring a black light with you. Don't bring a black light. <laughs> no. <laughs> on a train, a plane, a hotel room. You don't, you don't want to know. know. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to know. You know, if you're traveling and you're very nervous about it, most of them aren't big. They're probably, you know, eight inches, you know, maybe 10 by 12 by six. You know, you can pack that into a larger suitcase, bring mm-hmm. it wherever you're staying and run it for a few hours when you're not there. But bring your timer because you can't walk right. in while it's running. So before okay. we move on to something else, Jesse, I want to circle back to standards of certification. Um, I didn't want to interrupt when you were talking about that, but it sounds to me, you know, you've chosen to align yourself sort of like realtors with the National Association of Realtors, meaning you've chosen to align yourself with certain standards of practice and ethics and so on and so forth. What does everybody else do? Meaning where the large majority of inspectors fall in terms of, you know, do they align themselves with associations that have standards of practice? Are all home inspectors different in terms of the way they inspect? Do they all look at the same things? I mean, I I still want to get clear on that for our listeners. Sure. So I like... I always recommend that you you go through one of the the areas and you know whether it's Internachi or whether it's Ashi. I don't remember an Internachi's website. Um, I'm not a member, but they're they're a good organization as well. Um, I would say probably most home inspectors do go through that. I would say it's the majority are aligned with some organization uh, because they realize that you know to get on any of the um, the real estate brokers list, they want people that are, that, you know, are, are reputable and reliable. So I think it's so you could be, money. you could be an inspector and not be quote unquote certified Correct. like anything else. You would have to go through a certification process to be certified in that particular organization's practice and right. standards. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you could be a standalone home inspector. You could be. Yeah. And just because somebody's not, I'm, I'm not going to make the statement that just because somebody is not with one of the organizations that they're not a good inspector, there's sure. just 
checks and balances for it. So there's no way to check that out except, sure. you know, but I mean, look at reviews and, um, but I would say that the majority of them are with one of the organizations. Yeah. And is there a standard uh, list that everybody goes through or everybody kind of does their own thing? I mean, I understand if you're with an organization, there is. But, you know, in general, in the industry, in the is, industry is there a uh, list you all follow? A most, of us follow most of us follow the ASHI standards of practice. Okay. And anybody can go and download that list. And basically it goes through, you know, we have to disclose, you know, any issues with the foundation, um, look at all of the structural issues, go through like all the different um, types of roofing, you know, how, how old we think the roof is, you know, we're never, right. unless we have documentation telling us exactly what day it was installed, I can only give you a range of how old I think it is based on its wear. Okay. And so, um, yeah, it, you know, but the ASHI standards of practice is pretty much the one that most people go by. I would say. Okay. We need to start, we need to start, I was going to say, we need to start wrapping it up, but I went, did want to just put in there. I've only really had one really bad inspection, um, mm -hmm. an inspector for a client of mine. And um, we ended up redoing, we ended up hiring somebody else to come in and, and, and do another one. And I would just say and encourage anybody, if you ever have that, and, and it was an interesting situation. He didn't have the same tools and stuff that a lot of inspectors do. He wasn't mm -hmm. automated and the report just was not what we expected or, or, or would have expected from a, it was an odd situation. Like I've said, I've never had that happen before, but I think I paid, well, I know I paid for the second one because I felt bad that it even happened that way, but what don't made his, what made his, was it something he did or just the way he approached it? It was just the way he approached it. He had not, he was not with the technology that people have now, you know, now you've got the technology where it's a very, and, and the report was lacking. It didn't have the photos. It just wasn't thorough. Yeah. And, um, and I guess the, my buyer paid for the second inspection, but I did, um, some other things for her down the road because I just felt bad. It was like, but we had to do another inspection. I wasn't going to let her buy a home that had not been appropriate. And he was a nice guy. So we felt bad doing it, but nice isn't, doesn't matter when you're looking at no, it. It's like, it's like the estimators in the moving industry that still carry the clipboards, you know? Yeah. The old guard. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, so we needed somebody and we were, it was out in the country. So it was just a different, it was a whole different ball game than buying something within the city limits of Dallas. Right. But that would be my one piece of advice would be if you if you don't feel good, if you don't feel confident, if you want second opinions, even if you maybe you just have bring a second opinion in and you bring an HVAC guy in or somebody or a plumber to just double check what the inspection has revealed. Don't second guess doing that. Do it. You've got the inspect. You've got the um, option period. And that's what it's for. Sure. So before we do wrap up, Jesse, what would you What's the best piece of advice you can give our the consumers in our community today so that they really are protected, aware, and able to prepare themselves for the buying and selling of their of their of a home? Sure. Um, the number one, I would say, you know, as you um, uh, mentioned earlier, just to reiterate it is, you know, don't get emotionally attached. It is a business yeah. transaction. It's, you know, it, it, it's so emotional for people and, you know, so separate yourself emotionally, look at it from a business standpoint. That's the number one, uh, because that's going to help you to interpret all the information that you're getting on a much more clean, concise right. amount of data. Um, the, you know, the second is, you know, attend the inspection, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when, when you're there and you're seeing it in person, when I tell you right. that improper grading and that there's moisture intrusion, I don't want you to think that you need to get excavators in and that you have a river running through it. You know, it's, you know, there's a little bit of moisture and, you know, it might take you 30 minutes to fix that in, um, you know, the regrading. That's something that goes on basically every report that I do. So, um, you know, those are- But, but then I think it's also important to take this report and discuss it with your realtor or someone to be able to make educated decisions about what you are going to address and what you are, what you right. are not, and what the impact yeah. Yeah. of doing so is, both financially, cosmetically. And even, you know, I always tell my, my buyers too, when you get this report, don't hesitate to reach out and have me explain something to you. If you have questions, I want you to be comfortable with the, with the information that I'm giving to you. You know, I'm not just like a one and done and you'll never hear from me again. Um, if you if you have questions, just last night I was on the phone, you know, at nine o'clock at night with a home buyer that 
they're moving from out of town and they don't have the uh, ability to be in in town when they're buying and that's frightening to buy you know a six hundred thousand dollar house unseen and so i had no problems you know chatting with them for a little bit and really discussing you know the extent of what what i had found and how to you know remediate those those issues um, so, you know, make sure you're, you know, you're hiring an inspector that will go over the report with you afterwards. Um, I've had people that have asked me for a sample report of, of how I write a report. You can, you can ask for that. They may or may not give it to you, but then you can see the quality of work that you're going to get. And, yeah. and Lindy, you're right. Like I've seen, um, reports that have come from like little tiny, small towns and out in the country, there are guys that print off literally a checklist and they check good, not good. Inspected, right. Not inspected. And that was about the way this one was. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it. Right. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, they're only $250. Wow. I can't believe they even charged you $250. Yeah. For that. Right. That's $250 for a whole lot of nothing. For a whole right. lot of nothing. Yeah. So I actually do travel farther for my clients. I charge a travel fee because if it's going to take me a whole day, I need to build that in. Mm -hmm. But there are some that are, you know, doing a vacation home that they want to know it's good. So they don't care about pay paying the extra money for that large investment. So you yeah. can ask somebody to travel if you trust them. Yeah. So, yep. Bill asked an interesting question. Bill is an agent in Boston and he asked if, um, if Pennsylvania requires seller's disclosures and I'm assuming they do. They do. Okay. I, I know it's like, I, I, don't, I don't know of any states that don't, but I know in Europe and stuff that's it's done handled a little bit differently. Um, have you ever had a buyer send you the seller's disclosure before you visited the, the property to get your opinion on anything? Oh yeah. I, I asked for that to be sent. Um, most of my real estate agents that I work with on a regular basis yeah. I need the yeah. disclosure ahead of time. And I look at it, I take it with a grain of salt because sure. it's missing a lot of information and there's often a lot of in, incorrect information. And not that I think that the seller is trying to get anything over, but they just don't know. You know, they don't know. Which I think is what's interesting about some of these new technologies coming up that I mentioned earlier, because I think it's going to make that more uniform. Because like, if you ask me what kind of HVAC do I have, is it a 16 sear, is it 18 sear? I don't know. Yeah. You know, if, if I, I have a quick question. You know, we, Lindy and I are really focusing on um, okay. educating our, our consumer community, our buyers and sellers with truth. Would you be available if someone reached out to you and of course our producer lisa ireton is going to be putting your contact information below um but would you be available to to spend you know five or ten minutes on the phone with someone who really has some specific questions that they would feel more comfortable speaking with someone rather than just looking on your website sure um yeah they can absolutely email me um i will tell you my you know um, as opposed to a phone call because, um, you know, I, my, my time has just been pretty insane sure, lately. Okay. So it. it's easier for me to respond to an email at 11 o'clock at night than to take a phone call at any time. So, but I, I'm not opposed to that. You know, I, then I can schedule something with somebody or I can just send them an email back and, you know, i kind of handle it from, from there on. Um, you know, and can we expect this type of setup? I don't know how many franchises pillar to post has in the U S but, can, can we expect standardization of service and practice in all their locations? Uh, for the for the most part, we do have standards of practice. I am uh, like I go kind of I, just the way my personality type is. I go a bit above and beyond. Um, but there are uh, I think close to six hundred franchises in the in the wow. US. Yeah, in Canada, it's so. Uh, so where, where where do we go to find the franchise closest to us? Pillar2post.com. Yeah, and you it. can look at the search by uh, zip code. Um, real quick, Barbara does mention about selling as is, which I think is an important thing for somebody to know if they're buying a house. If they're buying a house and the seller says they're selling it as is, um, and you can tell me your opinion on this, but that doesn't mean you still can't do an inspection. Oh, absolutely. You should do an inspection. Yeah, you should still do one. You, absolutely, yeah. because you yeah. won't know what it is you're buying. I actually work with a lot of property investors um, that have been doing this for years. And I do, I call it an inspection savvy and, um, you know, an investor savvy inspection where I'm just looking at the, at the big four as opposed to everything in the home, but for right. sure get it inspected because even though it's as is, you might not realize that that needs $30,000 worth of right. structural. Well, if you've ever watched those property shows where they buy something and then they find out that they've got to redo the foundation or right. they've got 
do the plumbing. Yeah. Um, and Bill made a comment too that Massachusetts does not require a seller's disclosure. And I'm not licensed in Massachusetts. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Hmm. I did not know that either. Again, buyer or seller, educate yourselves and beware. Yeah. yeah. So um, I would suggest if you're in a state that does not offer seller's disclosures, that you just look at a seller disclosure yourself and, and pose those questions to your real estate agent to pass on to theirs and have them answer. Right. If you're looking at making because that investment. Yeah. Ask. Because you've got an investment once you get into that option period, because you're paying that option money, you're paying for an inspection and that getting that information ahead of time can make you, you know, help you decide whether or not you want to go ahead and invest that. It can be about, it can be a thousand dollars or more that you're going to walk away from if you find things in the inspection and decide not to buy. So right. yeah, I have to say, Jess, this has been, this has been one of my favorite shows. No oh, question. You. you are just a really neat, interesting person with a tool belt. <laughs> and this has been so informative and educational um, for, for sellers today. It's really been a pleasure to, yeah. to talk about all aspects of the home inspection with you. You're definitely a rock star. And thank you so much for your service in the um, Air Force and, um, and for all that you do. And especially um, good luck on your new venture. Oh, Excited to uh, yeah, see what that is. You have posted. Yeah, I will. I will be uh, releasing some information um, on my LinkedIn account once, uh, well, across all of my accounts, I actually have a press release ready um, that's being prepared to go out. Uh, to Good the for list. you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's it's yeah. it's a big, you know, it, it's a game changer, to be honest with you. Yeah. So yeah. I'll be inspecting for as long as I can. And then as soon as the, you know, but I'll always have this knowledge and I'll always be able to, yeah. you know, reach out. And no question. Me. So no question. Thank you. Today and be sure to connect with Jesse and Jesse. We appreciate you being here so much and sharing your knowledge and um, and your um, creativity. <laughs> All right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Saturday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.